And welcome to the last morning session for day two. My name is Felix Silva, creator and host of Bid21. Uh, welcome if this is your first session. If you are coming back for, for more, welcome back. Um, it would be great to hear where you all are in the chat. So uh, feel free to say hi to Donna and where you're joining from in the chat. That would be wonderful. Uh, we are in for a bit of a treat. Uh, Donna McGeorge is joining us on how do we achieve more by doing less, which I have to say is something I would love to know more about because I'm doing a hell of a lot and doing a little bit less would be a good thing. But before we get in Donna up on the screen, uh, Donna is passionate about enhancing, enhancing the large amount of time we spent in the workplace, which is obviously too much for many of us. And, to, and how do we ensure to be effective and productive as well as enjoyable? Donna believes that workplaces are complex, but not hard. And more often than not, it's the simple things um, done right that have the greatest impact on, on how we go about everything. She also knows that if we decide to be intentional, we can surpri surprise ourselves with what we can achieve. She's written a massive 10 books and publications, including the bestsellers, The 25 Minute Meeting and The First Two Hours, both of which, if they're not on your bookshelves already, should be there ASAP. Um, Donna, welcome. Um, it's great to have you back. You were a highlight of Vid19 last year, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you're in Vid21 again. Thank you, lovely Julia. I um, I just realised last last year at Vid19, uh, I presented new material, which was brand new material that I'd never presented to anyone ever before. And guess what? Doing the same thing again this year. So I'm presenting some new thinking um, that's forming part of my new book. More on that later. And I'm just um, just kind of again testing. I love testing stuff with your market. Uh, thanks, Julia, with your audience, just to see what happens. So, I am, you know, as Julia said, I, I, I essentially I'm a productivity uh, person. I'm passionate about making work work. And for me, my new kind of angle on all of this is around effortless productivity. You know, how do we become the kind of people that every day just look like? they're getting through a pile of stuff, but it doesn't look like they're freaking out or, or overwhelmed or tired and exhausted. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we could get everything done that we need to get done without having to be exhausted? I mean, seriously, that would, for me, that's the end game. Um, and at a higher level, my end game is giving people back to the people or activities that are most important to them. Because when we're not getting done what we need to get done, what happens is it ends up eating into our family time, our spare time, our important time, our hobbies, the things that bring us joy. And so what, what I'm about is how can we get work done at work to free us up to do the things that bring us the most joy? And so that's what this one's about. So today I'm going to talk to you about how might we achieve more by doing less. Um, and I've got a sub subheading here of, of the 15% rule. And so um, I'm probably giving a little bit away before I even get started, but let's dive in anyway and see what we reckon. So first of all, um, I'd love you to, to pop into the chat. Imagine you have a bucket of water and you need to get it um, somewhere as fast as possible and as full as possible. How full should the bucket be in order to get the maximum amount of water there in the maximum amount of time? I'd love you to um, have a crack in the, uh, in the um, chat. What, what capacity should it be at? Is it full? Is it half full? What percentage do you reckon it needs to be full in order to get the maximum amount of water? About three quarters, says Sue, good one. Um, and so ab about how much do you think it needs to be full? So we can't let Sue just speak for all of us. The rest of you have to go in. Okay, Linda, we've got 80%, two thirds, there you go. So I don't think it'll be any surprise at a run about half. So here's the thing, this is the rule, right? Does it, it actually doesn't matter. It just depends on how much time it will take. So if I wanna get 100% of the bucket from point A to point B, then I'm gonna to have to walk really slowly to get it all there all in one piece, right? 
if I only have it about half full, I can probably sprint that sucker from point A to point B. But if I want to do it, what, what's the optimal speed? It's around, would you believe, somewhere between 20 and, uh, sorry, uh, 80 and 85%. And so this is around what's the, yes, exactly, Mel, it's good information for people on Survivor. So if I want to get the maximum there and be able to operate at pace, it's around 80 to 85%. All right, so the next thing I want you to do is I'm going to show you a couple of pictures and I want you to just put, you know, this is kind of like word association, show you picture, what do you think? So the moment you see the picture, pop into the chat, what do you think? Here we go. When you look at this picture, what immediately happens to you? What do you think? Clutter, thanks Wendy, busy. Yeah, it's very busy, isn't it? There's a lot going on here. Clothes, very good. Are you? <laughs> I've got nothing to wear. Wendy, here's the interesting thing. So there's a couple of things at play when we look at a wardrobe like this. First of all, um, you, you think you've got nothing to wear because you can't actually see what you've got. Um, and so that's one aspect of it. And the second thing is we uh, end up not being able to know what we've got in there. So there's some stuff hidden away in here. We can't see everything, but also uh, we're uh, overwhelmed with choice. And what happens when we're overwhelmed with choice is we start to shut down. Um, and so, jo Joanne, I reckon you're right. There's a lot of chaos in here we can do something about, but it is a little disorganised and a little overwhelming. So imagine starting your day every day, opening your wardrobe and seeing this. I suspect you'd probably feel a little overwhelmed. All right, how about this one? Once again, it may be same, same, but a bit different. So what I want you to do here is just tell me again, what's your reaction to it? Wow, right? Yeah, a lot of books, it's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. So I don't know whether these wows and oohs are good wows and oohs, like envy of the amount of stuff or where to start. I know, right? So here's the thing. You've got a, a child and they come to you and say, hey, mum or dad, um, can you please help me find my Harry Potter books? So the first person to find them, just pop it into the chat um, and you get a prize. The first person to tell me where the Harry Potter books are, I'll send you a prize of one of my books. Top shelf. Oh, oh Sarah. Sarah got it, top shelf, about the middle, hey? So we just, um, can someone make a note? I'll probably try and remember, but Sarah Wong, um, after this, I'll get your, your details and I'll send you uh, the 25 minute meeting in the first two hours. If you haven't already got them, um, I'll send them to you. So nice work. So yeah, they are on the top shelf. Now, the thing is, um, I, I don't even want to go to where, what Sarah's age might be, but I suspect if you are part of the Harry Potter world, you can recognize the books pretty quickly and easily. And there there's the green and the red and the blue and the orange up on the top middle shelf. And they are ages. I get that. I'm not, this is not being me. I'm not being ageist because um, I'm a huge fan. So if you know where to find them, you can. But here's the thing. What if I said to you somewhere in there is a copy of Pride and Prejudice? Now, I'm not even going to ask you to look for that because first of all, you wouldn't even know what to look for because unless you know that it might be the, the, um, penguin version with the orange and white or is it a new version that's got you know one of those fancy ones with the leather covers how do we even know harry potter's a bit more distinctive we can find it but for anything else holy cow i wouldn't even know where to start and you're right joanne i would look for the penguin version as well it's in there somewhere i'm not going to even continue there all right now reaction to this next one um trash bag start again it is a bit like where's wally it is exactly like where's wally all right, how about this? How do you feel about this one? So uh, Ikea, boring, nice, relaxed. Okay, here's the thing. Whether you think it's boring or, you know, who's got a wardrobe that's disorganized, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's tidy and you can find stuff. Um, and it's, it's, you know, I can quickly at a glance find my favorite white and yellow or white and mustard spotty dress and I can instantly find the shoes that might go with that. So it is a bit boring. And anyone that's looking at this going, you're dreaming, uh, you're probably right. I don't know anyone that actually has a wardrobe like this, but there's a reason why IKEA displays look like this because it's appealing, right? Now, whether you think it's boring or whatever, we look at this and we go, yeah, but I, I can relax with that. I don't feel overwhelmed by it, but I can look at it and go, I'm more good. Um, and so again, this is not necessarily whether you like yellow or not. Thanks, Mel. It's just around, wow, at least I, I know I can put my hand on everything there. Whereas the previous wardrobe, I wouldn't even know where my yellow spotty dress is in amongst all of that. All right. 
And same, whoops, why aren't you working? Let me just do this. All right, how about this one? Same with this one. So again, I reckon the Pride and Prejudice books are somewhere in the top right, looking in those leather boundy kind of books. There's no Harry Potter here, which makes me a little bit sad. But again, it's space. And there's something about space that helps us feel like we are efficient, in control, that life feels effortless. And there are, you know, I'm not going to get into the Myers-Briggs that says, you know, my personality type is more like, I just work in organized chaos, blah, 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 blah. What I'm going to say to you is that um, all the research I've read about feeling organized and getting stuff done and produ productivity says that we need space. Um, and the people who are the most productive are the ones that have actual room around them. And so I look at this bookcase and I, I, I am a bit aspirational about this. I'm not going to show you mine right now because this is a little bit of a, um, a, a what do you call it? A physician heal, heal thyself. Um, I, my, my book shall start like this at the beginning of the year. And then at the end of the year, kind of look a bit like that. And then I have to do a bit of a clean up again to get it back to that. I suspect my wardrobe's a bit the same. Starts out big clean up like this by the end of the year. Holy cow, it's back to overload again. So I'm, I'm very um, aspirational myself about this. I'm very happy to say that I'm not perfect in this regard. But here's the thing. This is how we feel about wardrobes, about bookshelves, about cutlery drawers. I could show you heaps of pictures of cutlery drawers that make your hair curl. Or garages, you go out the garage, you pull the thing up and it's like, like just crap everywhere. Tupperware, cupboards, all of that. Imagine if this is happening in our head. So this is, this is what's happening in our head. Our head is overwhelmed, over cluttered, um, over, over, like just got stuff going on. And so if I had to say to you, what is the capacity of your head right now? Is it at about 80 to 85%? It's probably a little bit less, actually. This is probably about 60%, maybe 70%. What's the mental capacity are you operating at? And what I've discovered is that most of us are operating at around, if not more than 100%. And so I know you can't really have more than 100%, like the, any physicists or whatever in, on the call right now would give me a really hard time if I want to say we're operating at 120%. But actually, if you think about your day being, a, it's meant to be in, in Victoria, we had a public holiday yesterday in celebration of Labor Day. Um, and what that was meant to be celebrating is the Australian way of life of eight hours of work, eight hours of leisure and eight hours of sleep. And so if you think that we're meant to only work eight hours a day, that would be considered 100% capacity. And so if you're working nine, 10, 12, 16, whatever hours, you're now operating at over 100% capacity. That's kind of my argument. It's what I'm going to stick with for the moment. Just let's just go with it, shall we? And so what happens is, yeah, good, thanks, Sue. Sounds good to Sue. So what happens is um, we end up operating out of control in terms of capacity. And so if we start at the bottom, I've got greater than 100%, meaning that I'm using, I'm, I'm operating at more than. So I'm over 100%. I've probably got zero time and energy and I'm probably feeling hyper stress. Now, hyper stress is where I've actually got a client that I'm working with right now who is just, she, she talks a million miles an hour, she can't really keep up with other things, she's sort of gone out of the place, and then something else, something happens, she's got no room for anything, and then this, something else, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, dude, you gotta just slow down. But her world is so overwhelmed, she's got no time or energy for anything. And even that, it, it sounds energetic how fast she's talking, but that's like the moment she stops, she falls in a massive heap. Now, a lot of us operate like that, that the moment we stop, we're going to fall in a massive heap. Now, if we've got, if we're operating at about 100%, where we've got barely adequate time and energy, and we're probably still at some level of distress, which we're feeling stressed, we're feeling out of control, et cetera. Um, and I would say the vast majority of people I work with probably fall into that category, that they know that they're a bit stressed, they're pushy. They get to the end of the day, and I reckon this might be some of you, you get to the end of the day and you just like, you know, you've had a really, really busy day, but you probably can't put your finger on what you've achieved or you're just feeling overwhelmed and exhausted. And so that's, that's where a lot of people are operating here. And so those of us who occasionally, <laughs> occasionally manage to operate at about 80 or less, we typically have plenty of time and energy and we often feel the eustress of that. So eustress, if you don't know, is, is euphoric stress. 
that I know I'm working hard and I'm getting stuff done and I'm pushing, but actually what's happening is, and I'm feeling good about that. So I have a busy day, get to the end of the day and I'm pumped because of how good the day has been. And so th this is where we're wanting to play. So I'd love you just to pop into the chat about how much capacity are you, are you operating at most days? Is it, you know, is it 80? You're pretty good? Yeah, operating pretty well. Is it around 100? I'm pretty full most days and there's not a lot of room here for stuff. Or are you operating greater than 100 where there is just no room for error? One little thing goes wrong and boom, we're out. Yeah, Julia says, uh, you stress is what I call good knackered. I love that feeling. So the thing about the difference for me, what I know, because I can, they can sometimes physiologically feel the same, a bit of I'm tired at the end of the day, but the you stress is for me, I've got, I can talk to my hubby. If he comes up and says, how was your day? I've got something left. I can say, yep, good, great. Here's what I did. On the days when I've had been flat out, he'll come up and say, how was your day? And I'm like, dude, I've got nothing. And he goes, right, here's a drink just pops a drink straight in front of me, right? Because he knows there's nothing much else happening there. So I'm seeing a few people saying you're operating at about 80%. Great. That's really good. We've got to keep you there. Um, so any of you that are operating at a bit more than that, it depends. So COVID had an interesting effect. My experience of COVID was some people, it totally dropped the amount of work they had to do. Um, and so they were in a little bit more, um, had a bit more capacity, time and energy. And others, it totally pushed them. So it really kind of depended on the nature of your work. So, all right, so let's play around with this a little bit more. So quick model wouldn't be one of these presentations without a beautiful model. So here we go. Um, and the axes we're talking about here are, are we time rich or poor or energy rich or poor? Um, and here's what kind of happens with us. So those of us who are time poor and energy poor, we've got zero capacity. So we, we've got no time to get anything done and we don't have a lot of energy. And even though um, my client that I described who talks at a million miles an hour, blah, 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 sounds like it's energetic, it actually isn't. It's full-blown adrenaline. She's got nothing left in the tank. And at any moment, she could absolutely fall in a heap. Um, so some of us uh, might be operating according to time rich and energy poor. Um, and this is a little bit, some, I'm going to fess up sometimes, this might be a bit me, where I've had a really big week, a lot of delivery, and I get to the weekend and I've just got nothing left in the tank. So I've got heaps of time, whole two days, but I just cannot get off the couch and I have no energy for anything other than Netflix. Really? You know? So it could be that we're wasting our time in here as well. We're, we're time rich, but we're doing the wrong things um, and we haven't got maybe the mental capacity to uh, do other stuff. And so then we might be energy rich, but time poor. Now, this for me is one of the interesting ones. So this is what I refer to as surge capacity. But again, if I've got anyone um, that, that has a more physics or, or scientific uh, definition of this, I know I'm probably messing with your formal definitions a little bit. But surge capacity, all of us have surge capacity, which is when something so you're going along beautifully and an emergency or something happens that requires urgent attention and we can react and so surge capacity is our ability to react in the moment um, and the other way we can look at this is in hospitals for example they have what they call usual operating capacity uh, which is would you believe around 85 percent uh, of capacity in the hospital and and uh, of their staff etc but if there's a, an emergency um, so there's a big weather event that happens and maybe people are injured and hurt. They can surge. They bring in extra staff and they're able to surge to, to be able to respond. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Us as individuals, we have that ability to. We have that ability to surge if we have to. Where it becomes a bit tricky, though, is if we're constantly in surge. Thanks, Sue. Yes, this is the urgency addiction and so if we're constantly operating in surge, I think we end up dropped down. I think that in, in the end, we do run out of energy and we are running on the adrenaline and we are ending up in a pretty awful space. And so I, I've got clients, organisational clients, where everything is constantly urgent and they're asking their people, you're right, adrenal fatigue, you're so right, Joanne, when they're constantly operating in surge mode. And the, the trouble is it's almost like we, we still can it's almost like when we have to dig deep, we can still find that extra little bit, but to what cost? 
And so we end up with um, burnout. That's exactly where it lives, Leah. It's burnout. We end up um, uh, with adrenal fatigue. We end up sick. We end up in kind of getting to that distress and hyper stress space because we're not taking the time to heal. It's funny that the human body generally, I'm, I'm going to generalize massively here, um, we can both run marathons and do sprints. But depending on what we do, depends on what the recovery time is afterwards. And so if we do a sprint, which was what I would call a surge capacity, we have to then rest quite significantly afterwards. In fact, there was a really great study done back at the turn of the 20th century with um, having a mental blank now on his name, but it will come to me. Um, uh, the original kind of management consultant. Mm. Anyway, if you can think about it, pop it into the chat. Anyway, he did a study where he was looking at um, how much capacity could uh, men at the time uh, load pig iron onto the back of railway um, carriages. I don't even know what pig iron is, but I'm assuming it's heavy. Um, I don't think it's shaped like a pig, but anywho. Uh, so how much they could load onto the back of a, a tractor, uh, sorry, of a, of a railway cart. And what they would do is he, he was measuring how much time they would work and how many breaks they would have. And so the, the optimal that he found was that if they worked for 25 minutes and then took a break for 35 minutes in the hour, as compared to people that did a classic nine to five kind of day where they had a 15 minute break and half hour or an hour lunch and then a 15 minute break in the afternoon. So that was the comparison. Um, the people who did the 25 minutes of surging and then 35 minutes of resting loaded, wait for it, 600% more pig iron into the railway um, carriages. And so when we, if we are gonna have to sprint or surge, we have to rest. So I'm totally good with that. Today for me, doing this presentation is almost like a surge. It's like, you know, compared to two hours ago, sitting in front of my computer, processing a bit of email, this is now I'm on and I'm good and I'm using energy and I'm surging to some extent. I'm energy rich, I'm time poor, I've only got an hour and I've got to bring it, right? But after this, you bet I'm going to go and have a bit of a rest, have something to eat, you know, sit on the veranda. Uh, any of you that know me well enough will know, I'll pop the kettle on and have a cup of tea. And so we cannot continue um, to surge uh, without taking a break. Oh, thank you, Julia, for the scientific instruction. Pig iron is used to make steel. Ha, who knew? Still don't know what's called pig. No need to explore that. I can do that later because it would be better for the story. Hey, if I do that later. Now, here's the capacity I want us to play with where we're energy rich and time rich. And it's called, one moment, it's called adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity in a systemic context, here's the science bit, is any system organisation, and it's often used also in, um, got a bit of Darwinian background. Frederick W. Taylor, thank you. Frederick Winslow Taylor, that's the one. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, Sue. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ball boys. All good. So... Adaptive capacity is our ability or any system's ability. When a change happens, it can not only react positively to the change, but it can take advantage of the new conditions. And so there's a great story, if you want to go look for it, around how this happened during COVID. So, you know, you could say we're talking adaptive capacity and just the word, I don't know how many times you'll hear this over the course of this conference, but I'm going to say the P word, you know, I'm going to say it, pivot. So our ability to pivot um, was directly related to how much adaptive capacity we had. And so, no, I know, sorry, sorry, just delete that bit. When we do the recording, we'll just bleep that bit out, I reckon. Um, so our adaptive capacity is our ability to, I'm going to go with the, the, the take advantage of the changing situation. Now, my favourite story from the whole COVID thing is an Australian company called Stage Kings. And of course, like everyone, around the 13th of March, about a year ago, 13th of March, um, they were the people that looked after, um, you know, putting up big events and putting all the stage together and all of that sort of stuff. And so, of course, like a lot of us, their business just collapsed. So that's it, all gone, all over. And they took the time, they had A, 
um, they had sufficient funds that they could keep their team going for a short amount of time. So they brought their smart folks in. Well, they, all their folks were smart. I shouldn't make that sound. They, they brought their people in who were super smart and they sat um, and said, what can we do? And they just went nuts. And where they landed was they had all the ability and all the equipment and all the capacity and the know-how and the skill to create work from home desks. And so overnight, they went from creating stages to creating desks. And the, they not only did they thrive during that time, but they also be, they doubled or tripled, I think, their employee level. So they became an employer at a time when lots of organisations were downsizing. So I love this story, just like Julia does. I love this story because it shows that they had, they were energetic enough and had enough time to give themselves the space to think, how can we take advantage of this situation? Now, they would not have been able to do that if they were had all sorts of things. If they were running on fumes financially, if they were... Um, if they didn't have the, the right people there, if they basically if they didn't have the resources. So if you think of energy and time as resources, if you have insufficient resources, you can't take advantage of it. And so again, I, I looked at a lot of my colleagues and some who were able, to, they had sufficient resources available to them to be able to take advantage and adapt to the changing conditions. And so... That's what, I'm, that's what I'm passionate about. It's, it's not so much about, you know, have I got time and whatever. I want you to have sufficient adaptive capacity so that when, um, you know, when things are tough, when changes happen, when things don't go well, that you've got sufficient resources available to you that you're able to stop, take stock, and then decide what you're going to do. Because if you're operating at surge capacity, you probably don't have the time to think that through because you're kind of just operating on a treadmill. If you've got diminished, you've got no energy to think about anything, or if you're at zero, you probably, you, you can survive. Can we survive? Sure we can. And plenty of businesses did survive, but I'm not about that. I'm about how, how can we be effortlessly productive? How do we achieve more by doing less? And we cannot do that if we don't have some level of adaptive capacity. So here we go. So that's what I want for you, capacity, adaptive mostly, but capacity. So here's what I'm hearing from people. When they don't feel like they have sufficient capacity, they typically say they feel out of control, they feel overwhelmed, and they're failing at the important things. And so just put into the chat for me, you can say all of them or just one of them. Which one of those is the one that when you're running out of capacity, what's the first sign for you? I'm feeling out of control. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm failing at the important stuff. Yep, overwhelmed. Thanks, Sue. We just start feeling that stuff. Yep, a lot of people overwhelmed. And isn't it easy to get overwhelmed, right? So much information available to us out in the world. It's so easy to get overwhelmed. And so, um, thank you. So what I do is I help people, or what my model does and what my book is gonna do is help people get out of this cycle. Because what we actually want is we want sanity. And this is not in the uh, mental health realms. The, the definition of sanity is sound mind and sound judgment. Um, and so what happens when we're out of control is we don't actually make the right judgments, right? So we, make we don't make sound judgment. And that's the space that I'm really talking about in here. When we're overwhelmed, what we need is clarity. I just need to cut through everything and get clear on what I need to be doing. And when we're failing at the important stuff, we need certainty about what it is that is important to us and create some rules around that. So when we're talking about sanity, it's what I mentioned before. We, we, to get our sanity back, to get our sound judgment back, we have to stop, take stock, and then make decisions on what it is we need to do to move forward. When we're overwhelmed, and this is going to go a bit backwards because it's a cycle, so bear with me. When we're overwhelmed, we need to, based on what we've decided to do, we now define how we want our world, we diagnose where we're at, and then we design ourselves. I'm all about life by design, days by design, hours by design, quarters by design, years by design, uh, life by design, jobs by design. I'm all about that. Once we do that, then we have our boundaries. We have to figure out how we're going to put some boundaries in place. How do we make sure that we've got connection to all the right things? And I reckon the end game is that we just got to bring a bit more joy into our world and make sure that what we're doing is filling us with joy versus 
stress or anxiety or any of those other things that we have. And so it's about sanity, clarity, certainty, and it's a cycle. Um, now, at the moment, my hypothesis is the cycle goes from stop, take, stop, decide, then we define, diagnose, design, then we do boundaries, connection, and joy. But it occurred to me when I was putting the slide deck together that it's possible we could go the other way. What brings me joy? How do I get more connected to that? So what boundaries do I need to put in place? And then I still think it's defined, diagnosed, design at the bottom, I think. So that helps me then figure out what am I deciding to do, taking stock and stopping doing things that don't work. So I do think, remember, as I said, this is new thinking for me. My current hypothesis is that it goes in one way, but it could go the other way as well. But I'll let you. Um... So Sue says, I removed myself from the workplace to give myself space and engage in this conference. Yes. So this is an opportunity of you doing something other than work. So I'll talk later on specifically about 15% and how you find that in your life and time, because I think that's the answer. So if we think about capacity as the outcome, the tool is finding 15%. More on that in a minute. So I would love to take you through the whole model, but I don't have time for that today. And I wanted to you to come go away with something um, you know, a bit practical. So I'm going to talk about taking stock. I'm going to talk about connection and I'm going to talk about design today in terms of giving you some practical takeaways um, from this session. So I hope that's useful. So um, I think I'll just keep going and unless you tell me otherwise, if things don't feel like they're useful, just whack it in the chat. Happy to operate. So here we go. Work smart. Thanks, Sue. What does that actually mean? You know, how often do we hear that I need to work smarter, not harder, smarter? Like I think work smarter gets thrown around as much as pivot. Got to pivot and work smarter. Like, shut up. What does that actually mean? And so here's what I reckon it means. I think it's the 15% rule. So a couple of stories. Um, you probably know this. You probably are going to bleep that out too. Thanks, uh, Julia. Working smarter. Bleep, working smarter. The 15% rule. So many of you may or may not know that 3M, um, they... Uh, for their research and design people made a point of saying you have to block 15% of your time out, of your work time out to be creative, to come up with new ideas, to make space for innovation. And so they in effect said permission granted uh, to block 15% off and you don't have to account for it to anyone. It's just your time to sit back, think and come up with stuff. Now, I don't know if that's where post-it notes came. In fact, there's another kind of myth or story that goes around around post-it notes about it, um, you know, it was a failed experiment in glue that made it work. But I would suspect that no one can do a failed experiment with glue unless they're giving themselves the time to experiment with the glue, right? So I'm going to go with the 15% rule here. But I do know for a fact that 3M uh, do give their R&D people 15% of their time just to do kind of anything. And then I, I just read about this one recently, which I thought was really interesting. So this is Carl Lewis, if you don't know. He's one of the world's greatest ever um, athletes. Nine gold medals, I think, across four Olympic Games, which is a pretty hefty career, 20-odd years. And he was well known for being what's called a slow starter. So when he would do, say, the 100-metre sprint, he was always, you know, the last out of the blocks or the, he was always running in fourth or fifth position, you know, in the first, say, 10 metres of the race, um, and then he would win. And so lots of people studied him because what they were looking at is when other people would jump out of the blocks, they would be going their hardest, and so they'd screw their faces up and they'd have their fists up and they'd, like, imagine this is what a sprinter looks like, and they'd just be going really hard, right? They'd be going 100%. And what would happen is they'd run out of puff. So what subsequently they've discovered is that uh, Carl Lewis only ever ran at 85%, but he could do it consistently over time. So it appeared that he was a slow starter and a strong finisher, but actually he was just putting 85% of his energy in the whole time. And he got further and won more than his mates or, or uh, fellow competitors who would go hard at 100%. And so straight up now, I'd love you to think about what would happen if instead of trying to go hard all the time, I decided to operate at 85%. So just have a think about that because this is not about being lazy or slow or 
cheating or, or any, it's just around, if, if I know what 100% feels like and that's stressful, what if I just did 15% less every day? Now that's going to show up in things like your meetings. So in your diary, what would happen if you made sure that each day there was at least 15% of your day free? And so what that means is two things, particularly if you work in a world where you're constantly being pulled from pillar to post and things have to cancel because someone urgently needs you for something, um, it might be that you then often that feels stressful because you've never got time to shuffle things around. By leaving 15% in your diary each day, there's room for that. There's room if something, if you need to surge, right? There's room for a bit of surge or there's room for adaptive capacity. If something happens, you go, oh, I can take advantage of that. And so some of you that are coming here today, I know there's at least one of you, Linda, that probably didn't find out till quite the last minute that you could come here today and see even today or yesterday or whatever sessions you've been at. And if you didn't have some level of um, adaptive capacity in your world, you couldn't probably make the time to be here because if everything's urgent and we're all in back-to-backs, how do we make the time to do that? And so um, that's what I'm suggesting here is we begin to build in and operate in a world that is only at 15%. So either we carve out time or we think, do you know, if I'm writing a book, do I have to go 100% flat out every time I sit down to write? So even if I did the maths and said, I want to write a thousand words today, well, what if I only wrote 850? Right? And I probably, if I'm like my pig iron mates or if I'm like Carl... Lewis here, I'm probably going to be able to go further and be able to write longer and more and better rather than trying to go really hard and really fast all the time. So that's that's the thinking here. And so let's see, what does 15% equal? So if you're thinking, all right, I'm going to carve some time out. So in a 12-month year, you're going to carve out 1.8 months. So you're going to find your comfort threshold here. So am I going to block out 1.8 months every year? And I'm just, that's going to be my 15% and I'm going to do a whole bunch of chilling out, relaxing. So right now you're thinking, oh, gee, I don't know whether I can do that. Or maybe you are. Plenty of people take sabbaticals or block time out. So if it was a 12-week quarter, we're looking at 1.8 weeks. Um, And I do know there's um, one person that I I met in in, in a group that I was in who used to block out one week per quarter, every quarter, just to have downtime. So it's not quite 1.8 weeks. In a 20-day month, you'd be blocking out three days. And so you'd be giving yourself, you'd be having a couple of long weekends in there, potentially, if you wanted to, to create more space, or you might block out three whole days. In a 40-hour week, eight hours based on five days, again, if you're looking at that going, you're dreaming, well, have a think about it, it's six hours. Now, about now is where people start to go, I reckon I could do that. I reckon in a 40-hour week, I could block out just over half a day, maybe. I reckon I could block that out and I could protect that time. And how could you go doing 1.2 hours a day? And that's not including lunch. I'm waving my finger like a nanny here because you still got to have your lunch break. But what if you took 1.2 hours out and you don't, you just protected it? Now, if that means, you know, I've heard some people say I could add 1.2 hours on and then protect that. So I normally start, say, at 8.30. Well, what if I started at 7.30, started my work day at 7.30, and I protect that time? Well, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. And and that's not strictly, though, 15%, is it? So I reckon you'd have to block out maybe 1.3 hours if you're going to do that. But the point is, I don't reckon it's that hard if you just do the maths for yourself. And so blocking out 1.2 hours in your day, just so you, A, have time to breathe, catch up, um, react if I have to, you've got time in your day because it like urgent stuff happens for people all the time, right? It happens all the time. And so I, I often think of my, my dad who was in the military and he had a saying which was, if it's predictable, it's preventable. And so if we're constantly operating in a state of urgency, that's becoming predictable. So how now do we begin to prevent that? And we do it by blocking some time out so I have space to play catch-ups and breathe and react and respond. So in effect, you're blocking out urgency time if need be. Now, the risk is um, we can't let people book it. Absolutely. Um, Is 
is that we do what uh, Julia says. So you've really got to protect it for, for your adaptive capacity, not surge capacity. Because I reckon your surge capacity could still be cancel something else in your day if you had to. So it's a bit tricky. It's, it's, there's not much of a science to this. I reckon it's more of an art around how we manage this. And certainly I reckon at the very least, I reckon I know I could block out six hours in my week pretty easily by just saying, I'm gonna knock, I'm gonna knock off at about 12 o'clock or 11.30 on Fridays. I'm not gonna book any meetings beyond that. Some workplaces might give people half, about seven and a half percent. I know workplaces that use do summer hours where people knock off at two o'clock on a Friday during summer. And so there's always ways we can do. And yeah, keeping Mondays fairly free for unexpected stuff. And so for me, uh, as an independent consultant, for me, I like to have some room in my diary. I don't want to be booked out. I know some people wear that like a badge of honour. I am completely booked out for six months. Good for you. And what happens if a really extraordinary opportunity lands or a brand new client that you've been wanting to land for a while or there's just something new and amazing that you can do? I'm like, I want to have some space in my diary on the off chance that that sort of stuff happens. And the other thing I do is I want to have time to breathe and think and create, which is typically why I'm hired for my, for my smarts, for my thinking, for my IP. And I want to make sure I have space for that. So that's the question. What's doable for you? Whack it in the chat for me. A few people are, are popping in with the breakup. So um, take next month. Go, for, go you, Sue. So what do you reckon is the doable one for you? So given that, don't, don't do this in, in addition to what we already do. So as I said, you're not allowed to count lunch. And you're also not allowed to count your already existing four-week leave. So yeah, Julia, three days a month is really cool, right? So it means that if I just block that out, that's some space for me. Um, six hours in a week, go you, Linda. That's, that's a way to do it. When you're on a contract, doable is six hours a week. I agree. So it really depends on what you're doing, where you're at, what your work is, et cetera. All righty. So a couple of other things. So this is around how do we find 15%? And remember, I said this is kind of, we're going to talk about the stop and take stock bit here related to this model generally. And so here's three things that I think you could do within even that first one. So I've given you a little bit more. I've given you a bit of decide in here as well. So can you block some time out just to stop? And even following this session today, could you just stop? Um, at some point in the next few days, I know you've got comfort, you know, if you're going to go into all the sessions, there's quite a bit to see and do. But can I say, I reckon attending this is an example of stopping. It's an example of giving yourself time to think, time to breathe, sit back, participate, enjoy, meet other people in the chat, etc. So it is, it's, you're right, so it's feeding your soul. That's what this time is for. And then um, the take stock, it really depends on how you like to roll. I, I love to do this notion of the, um, the white, the mind. So I learned this from a colleague of mine called Tracy Ezard, um, who says she, she, she does exercises with leaders that are feeling overwhelmed, where she says, just, just stop, the stop part, and then literally write down everything that's on your mind that you have to get done from both your professional and personal life. Just write it all down. And so that's a massive brain dump. Then you could categorize it, should you choose to, around what you are currently working on, what you should be working on, and what you want to be working on. Because that can sometimes help figure out why I don't feel as inspired or why I'm overwhelmed or why I get to the end of my day. And what did Julia call it? Where I feel like I've had, I can't remember what the words were up the chat, but where I just feel like it hasn't been good. I've got nothing left in the tank. Because um, I think it's important to take stock of that. Good knackered. There you go. So whatever the opposite, bad knackered. I don't want you to be bad knackered. So sometimes we're bad knackered because we're working on things that we either don't want to be working on or that we shouldn't be working on. And so organizing your brain dump according to that can sometimes be useful. And then when you're looking at what you're, what you're working on, should be working on and want to be working on, you need to make the decisions here about what you are actually going to do through the lens of, does it matter? Is it really important to you uh, or someone else that it's important to? And is it vital? And so what would happen if you didn't do it? Would the world end? Now, there are some things you have to do that it's your job. You've got to pay the rent or mortgage. Maybe there's some study I've got to do. There's some things we have to do. 
And so, but this is not a bad lens to look through when we're trying to figure out what I should be doing. Does it matter? And is it vital? Now you've probably got others. There could be others. Um, and you're right, Joanne, no one dies by not doing the small stuff. I think it's interesting. One of my clients, long-time clients, um, before all the COVID thing happened was Flight Centre. And at one point, they got rid of all the receptionists and all the EAs and all the admin staff because their view was if it, if it wasn't important for you to do it, it wasn't important enough to give it to someone else. And so they piloted what would happen if we just ripped out all the admin staff and everyone just had to do their own. And what was interesting was how much just not got done, but also how much it didn't matter. It wasn't vital. It wasn't core. You know, so really think about some of that stuff. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit in a moment about email. I've got a great example here where sometimes we waste time and energy in things we probably don't need to be doing and no one would notice if we didn't do it. Oh, talk about that in a minute. So let me just make that happen again. This is a really cool tool I like for the connect piece. Um, so I found this in a book called, um, it's sitting right here, actually, The Bullet Journal Method. Um, just can't think, can't see the author's name here with these glasses on. Um, but he talks about doing a plan around uh, these four numbers. He said, so you, so you take a piece of paper like this, personal life, professional life, and what do I want to achieve in the next five years? Therefore, what have I got to do over the next four quarters? Therefore, what have I got to do in the next three months, two weeks, one day, and he calls it the 54321 tool. I love this because it helps connect. Thank you, Sarah, Ryder Carol. It, it helps um, connect the dots. So how does what I'm doing today connect with my five-year plan, both personally and professionally? And this is how we stay focused on the things that bring us joy and the things that, wait for it, matter. Right? Does it matter? Yes, because it's part of my plan. Now, um, I'm not that concerned about this, but Ryder Carroll says that the way you really use this effectively is that if you've got multiple items in each one, you then have to go through and highlight which of these in each box is the most important, the one I'm doing first. And the idea is you're not supposed to start another one from that box until the previous one's done. And so for me, if I'm writing, I'm writing a book at the moment, and so over the next two weeks would be my two week spot, I have to generate um, a chapter, which means today um, it, I probably need to do three or 400 words towards that chapter. And if I've got other things to do today, I have to do that, that first before I then do the other things. That's kind of how it works. Um, I'm, I'm not too much of a, I'm not a stickler necessarily for that because for me, the connection from what I'm doing today versus five years and vice versa, that's the powerful aspect of this. Isn't it so beautifully simple? I wish, Sue, that I'd made this up, which is always the case, right? Don't you love it when someone makes up something that's so elegant, beautiful? Wish I had done it, but anywho. All right, so finally, let's talk about design. Conscious of time, I want to give you a little bit of time for questions at the end. And this is a little bit self-serving, just saying. So first of all, this is not a plug. However, what I'm about to talk to you about is absolutely written about in this book, the first two hours. And in this book, I talk about um, making better use of your most um, valuable time, which is really means talking about, talking about your body clock. And so this is a 24 hour model of what our body's doing, our, our circadian rhythms, our body clock at any given time. And so the things I wanna draw your attention to is that we have high levels of mental alertness in the morning and we have our best coordination and reaction time physically in the afternoon. And so at a high level, I'd be saying, um, we think better in the morning and we move better in the afternoon. And so there's, there's lots of great interesting stuff around here about things like exercise. So when do you think the best time is to exercise? A lot of people say the morning, and I will say, well, it depends on what you want. If you're wanting to lose weight, exercising in the morning is the best time. If you're wanting to increase strength, in, uh, de-stress, increase durability, then the afternoon's better. Our body's warmed up. And it's, it's why most sporting injuries tend to happen in the morning, not the afternoon, because our body tends to be warmed up and it's a bit better. So all that being said, I'm not going to judge you. Um, 
were actually designed to go to sleep around nine o'clock at night where our melatonin secretion starts. Melatonin is what helps us feel sleepy. And then we're meant to, our melatonin stops at around sometime we're between six and seven. So we're meant to wake up. In effect, we're meant to go to sleep when it's dark and wake up when it's light. That's what we, we haven't changed since cavemen kind of thing, right? Sorry, cave people. So we're, um, that's what we're actually designed to do. Now we mess with this. We mess with this thanks to Thomas Edison who bloody invented the electric light, right? That's impacting how light works. So we muck, mess with our sleep, all sorts of things. But here's what we haven't been able to mess with. It's still true mostly that people have high levels of alertness in the morning and better physical coordination in the afternoon. So I want to then share with you the master model. So here's the thing, even though I'm plugging the book, don't need to buy it. I'm about to give you the best bit anyway. So there you go, you're getting it for free. Don't need to worry about uh, the book. So this is, this, the reason I did this model was because it overlays here. So um, if we are looking at high intensity, high impact, this is the stuff that has the biggest impact on our world. So the stuff that is valuable, important to us in our work, but requires high intensity, high brain energy. Yep. So you would think that's the stuff we want to do first. So in the first two hours of the day, this is the sort of stuff we need to be thinking about. So these are important email requests, uh, responses, presentations, all the stuff you can see here, stuff that requires my brain and my smarts to be on. Then if it's high intensity, my smarts are still on, but not necessarily high impact for me. So lower impact for me, but it could be high impact for others. So when other people need my smarts, so this is a good time for meetings. And so if I was structuring my day or designing my day, I would try to avoid as many meetings as possible in the morning, unless it was directly related to what I needed, my high impact stuff. And I'd try and book meetings safe from, you know, so I'd protect maybe from eight to 10 ish or not 8.39, you get the idea. The first couple of hours protect for me. Then I'd be happy to do meetings, particularly when people needed my smarts. I don't reckon this is the time for whip meetings. I think whip meetings are just as we report out sort of stuff. I don't reckon you need to do them in the morning. I'd be trying to figure out how can I do routine stuff when now, remember, my body is able to do some of the routine stuff. I can just, well, I don't have to think. No brain required. I can just be a little bit on autopilot. And so I said earlier that I was going to talk about email. And so I actually think um, email is one way in which we can really take advantage of the 15% rule and stop doing things that don't matter. So I don't, I'm not going to get you to... Uh, um, confess this you can just sit and have a quiet little confession on your own but if you're someone that's got a gazillion folders in your email I'm going to save you a whole truck ton of time right now you don't need them you need an inbox you need a deleted mail get rid of stuff you don't need and you just need a done folder because once you've actioned your email you can just whack it into done so straight up there you're saving yourself a gazillion decision fatigue moments trying to figure out which folder should it go in and later when it comes time to find the email, you've got to remember which folder to put it in. Blah, 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 blah. Actually, your done folder is easy, just as easily searchable as say Google would. So it's a throwback from the old days, right? I can have a love file. Oh, I love that, Mel. I, I'm going to get a love file as well. Um, in the olden days, original email did not have the ability to um, uh, search very well, but now it does. Really great search. So if you vaguely know who it was from, vaguely know when it was sent, vaguely know the topic, uh, you can find it. So you don't need to worry about all those folders. And that'll save you a truck ton of time just saying it doesn't matter. Uh, good time to go for a walk because physically it's good to get the air um, into the lungs and you'll have a much better afternoon in the fourth two hours if you do take a break and, and you know give yourself an opportunity to have a bit of a rest in the afternoon. And then in the last two hours, and even though the book's called the first two hours, I actually reckon the last two hours is one of the most impactful. What can I do in the last two hours of the day that sets me up for success for the first two hours the next day? So I finish up as much as I can in my inbox, you know, review my next day's meetings and to-dos, add to things tomorrow if I need to, and do things like preparing clothing and meals for the next day. Or if I am traveling somewhere, what's the route that I'm going to take? What time do I need to get up? What, you know, organize all of that, have my bag packed, good to go. So when I wake up in the morning, I'm not wasting energy 
on thinking about that stuff. I'm actually good to go and I can put my focus and energy is uh, on what I need to do. Um, Leah, I'm the same. Uh, the top three for the next day is a great thing to do. I do that as well. And I can't go to bed now unless it's a COVID day where I'm in my pyjamas and my moccasins. Um, I can't go to bed at night without thinking about what I'm going to wear and have it set up and at the end of my wardrobe. So I'm good to go. I just don't, because otherwise I get up. Now, my wardrobe's not at all like those first pictures that I showed you. But if I get up and look at my wardrobe, I immediately feel overwhelmed and I've got nothing to wear when actually I've got a gazillion things to wear. So if I've decided that the night before, I'm good to go in the morning. So basically, this is what we're doing in the first, second, third and fourth two hours. And that's how we design our day. Now, when we do design our day like this, we are being Carl Lewis. We're spreading our energy across the whole day in an effective way. We're not, con we're not operating at 100% straight out of the blocks. We're not operating at 100% all day. We're spreading our energy and our attention around the day when it needs to be done. This is how you design your day to be able to get so much more done. With, um, what is it? Achieve more <laughs> by actually doing less. Doing less. All right. So free stuff as I'm just about to wrap up. So this is easy. We've all been doing this in Melbourne. If you haven't in Australia, or if you're not in Australia, we're very used to these bloody QR code things. So if you take a photo or put your camera up onto the QR code, um, you're, you can get access to a download that has all the slides from today, the 54321 template with instructions and some pages from the first two hours journal. You can just download and print and use that help you carve your day up. So that's my gift to all of you for coming along today. And if you do want to reach out to me at any time, um, uh, these are my contact details. I was once told that I'm a shameless self-promoter. I'm like, yeah, thanks for noticing. I think they thought it was an insult. I didn't see it that way at all. Um, now, Sarah, I'm seeing you say thank you. You're the winner. Um, I will um, uh, reach out to you via this group. Someone will give me your details and I'll reach out to you, Sarah Wong. And just as a reminder, these are my two books um, and the third one is coming. Third one is coming. Pretty excited about that. So thank you so much for coming today. I'm going to hand back. We haven't got very little time for questions, but I'm happy to take any. So Julia, I'm going to hand back to you, my darling. Um, and thanks again for coming along and go vid 21. Love it. Thank you so much, Donna. It was, it was such a perfect session after Penny's session this morning where we talked about happiness and and making space for it and so to have you follow her session with you know how to how to actually make space is wonderful and I can't recommend uh, Donna's books enough um, she, her tools and tips and tricks help me no end I'm sure if you even if you just do a little bit of today you will get masses we've got a couple of minutes for questions maybe one or two questions if anyone has them while you're I've doing just that put the QR back up just in case anyone missed it before. So um, happy to take any questions. Otherwise, we can all take a two minute break. <laughs> what time's the next session, Julia? Uh, next session is Oscar Trimboli at five o'clock this evening. Oh. So we do have some space this afternoon. Love Oscar. People to go and do um, a few things. But uh, okay, yes. So, Leah, tip to stop yourself booking out time in your calendar and then booking over top of it. Um, Leah, I'm going to introduce you to another D word, which is discipline, darling. I wish I had something other than this for you. It's um, you've really got to protect your time um, and recognize. And, and I heard a phrase recently that was around my future self will thank me. So when you when you protect that time now, your your tomorrow self or your next day self will thank you for that. So when you think about making decisions today about how I'm blocking my time out or how I'm booking over top of staff or whatever, it's actually not the now person because the now person goes, ah, it's the future person that thanks you for not doing that. And so I, 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 I can't recommend that enough. Um, can you also use your RBF so people don't book then? <laughs> I use that on flights. I love my RBF. In the old days, when I get on an airplane, I wanted to use my, because that's the other thing I miss. I miss, that, that a lot of my 15% happened on flights where I could have downtime, I didn't have to think, didn't have to talk to anyone. And people would get on and they'd be smiling at you and be up for a yak. I'd be like, no, nah. RBF right at you. <laughs> nah. 
And then I don't care if they tell a story. I sat next to this woman on the flight. Holy cow, right? Like no pun intended, but there you go. So it was a good time. Um, so there you go, Leah, I'm sorry. I wish I had more. I'm also going to suggest that you color code. So maybe put in red the time or green, just pick a bright, vivid color. That is your totally have to protect it. Now you still get to choose. You still get to say, actually, I am going to give an hour of that away to someone, but I want you to do it consciously. I, if you're choosing to give that up, then that's going to have an impact on you a couple of days down the track. So absolutely color code and know that it's a conscious choice. So there we go. Hope that's helpful. All right, I think my time's up now. Time's Perfect. Up. Thanks so much, Donna. Um, please fill the chat if you if you haven't already with lots of love for Donna. And I really encourage you to check out everything. Scan away with your QR scanners, and we'll um, put the same image up in the in the uh, community as well, Donna, for you, so people can follow. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. See you tonight at five, with Oscar. Absolutely.